What's up, everybody? Metal Dave Glessner here, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster, bringing you another episode of the Talk Louder podcast. Our guest today is bassist Rick Fox. You know him probably best from his time in Steeler, put out a classic self-titled album with an unknown Ingve Malmsteen on guitar, Ron Keel on vocals, Mark Edwards on drums. Uh, beyond Steeler, Rick was also an early member of Wasp, actually named the band Wasp. And he is currently in a band called Freak Show featuring Carlos Cavasso of Quiet Riot. Uh, Stet Howland is on drums. Stet plays with Metal Church and was previously in Wasp. And the front man of that band is a guy named Ronnie Borchert, who uh, used to be in a band called Miss Crazy. The band is called Freak Show. The album is called So Shall It Be. It's out now. And wow, what a storied career. Rick grew up in New York. He saw Kiss in the club days. He got his first shag haircut from Peter Chris. I mean, that <laughs> was a cool story. Um, that right there is worth a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I'm <laughs> glad that that we had Rick on for multiple reasons. I, I'm a Steeler fan. I'm a Keel fan. So there's there's plenty of reasons there. Um and now his stories are just, you know, come on, Uncle Rick, tell us another one. You know, that's yeah. pretty much what it was like today, <laughs> hanging out with Rick. Uh, yeah. And he goes deep. Um, another great, fun, quite long episode. You might have to strap in for this one a little bit. Uh, Rick Fox today on the Talk Louder podcast. <laughs> Nice shirt. Yeah. Uh, well, you would know um, I'm a San Antonio kid. So uh, Legs Diamond was huge in San Antonio. That's what I'm told. Yeah. And, and, and very few other places, although they did pretty well, but they could still headline uh, big venues in San Antonio, come back with no new album or whatever. And they're, yeah, of, they're huge. Of all, of all places, too, San Antonio. Heavy metal capital of the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was, I was, I'm still friends with Michael Prince. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I was friends with Michael Diamond. He, he tagged out years ago and disappeared. Yeah. Uh, I saw Michael Prince a couple months ago. Uh, the band and I have a mutual friend who lives here in Austin. So once in a while, uh, Michael Prince and Jeff Poole will come hang out at my buddy's house and then he'll invite me over. And we had Jeff Poole and Michael Prince on the on the podcast before. And uh, so we've gotten to know each other a little bit um, over the years. And uh, so, yeah, they're they're great guys. I've been a fan for a long time, grew up on their music. And it was kind of it was really cool to have them on the podcast. Yeah, I saw them supporting Angel. In uh, nice. like seventy seven, at the Palladium in New York. Wow! I saw, I saw Angel. It was uh, opening with group was Piper. Okay. Oh, Billy, Billy, Billy Squire. Squire. Yeah, yeah. And then Legs Diamond and Angel. Wow! So, I saw Angel support Ted Nugent in seventy seven. Wow! Down in Corpus. Were, Angel was on the rise then. Down in court. Down in Corpus Christi. Yeah. I was ten years old in seventy seven. <laughs> <laughs> i was i was about i was about two don't lie well wow. wow. <laughs> everyone knows you're older than me and i'm older than both of you combined <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to catch up dude yeah well rick thanks for joining us today uh uh obviously you've got a lot of uh, history and we want to touch on a little bit of all of it as much as we can anyway uh but first let's start with your most recent news you're currently involved in a band called Freak Show. Uh, there is an album out called So Shall It Be. There we are. Um, now, to be clear, you're not on the album. You you joined the band after the album was recorded. So let's start with the, the lineup on the album is uh, Carlos Cavasso, obviously from Quiet Riot. Uh, Stet Howland on drums from Wasp and Metal Church. Uh, Ronnie, I'm going to get his last name wrong, Borchert. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from a band called Miss Crazy. And then on the album, the bass player is Greg Chason, who we've that's had a, on the show. That's uh, a fact. Yes. Greg, uh, yeah. most people will know Greg as the bass player from Badlands. He currently has a project called Atomic Kings. Right. And after the album was recorded, 
Uh, my understanding is Greg recommended you to join the band. You appear in the video for the single. Uh, tell us how you got involved and tell us a little bit about the album. I, you know, it's probably the fault of Steel Panther. <laughs> uh, Everything somebody, is Steel Panther's fault. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> posted uh, a clip of their performance on America's Got Talent on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I, I forget whose thread it was we were talking on. And I said, how come I'm not in a band like Steel Panther? I deserve that. And a couple of people responded and said, yeah, you know what? You're right. You should be in a band like Steel Panther. Greg Chason just happened to see that conversation, tagged me in it, and tagged Ronnie for a shirt. And then off offline, he told me, reach out, and, and I'm going to put you in touch with Ronnie. He goes, I just recorded an album with this band. He goes, you'd be perfect for it. He goes, I can't commit. I've already got Atomic Kings. I've got my store, you know, the music store. There's our guitar there in, in, in Phoenix. You know, he settled there. And, and so he says, I, I can't jump on that, that wagon with them. He goes, but he says, I just recorded the album. Greg and I have a lot of the same bass influences from the 70s. You know, your Humble Pie and, and Grand Funk Railroad and like that, so forth. So our styles are almost similar, even though I've done more metal stuff. And he's done more bluesy stuff. Right. But we still share that same commonality. And he said, this, this is right up your alley. He got in touch with Ronnie. He says, I got to recommend, you know, he, Ronnie goes, if you can't commit to who can you, can you recommend somebody? Greg told me, he told Ronnie, the first thing out of my mouth was Rick Fox. He goes, Rick would be perfect for this. He says, uh, 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 he told me, my bass lines are fairly easy enough to, you know, you can pick up on these. And once you got it down, there's room for you to kind of do whatever you want with them. Like that. Okay. So um, he put me in touch with Ronnie. Ronnie and I talked, and and uh, they they were also looking at two other uh, A-list bass players. Uh, I don't know if I'm at liberty to say who that was, but sure uh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, one of them was a bass player from Quiet Riot, and the other was a bass player with Cinderella. So that's why I'm not saying their names. Um, okay. And they, he, Ronnie said he talked to Carlos and Stet. And Stet and I have known each other since the 80s, right when he was first getting into Wasp. I was working at a, a, a moving company called Starving Students in L.A. Stet happened to come in with one other guy, another rocker guy. And we were like the three rocker guys working on the moving trucks together. So, you know, Stet and I go wait that far back. And uh, um, so they, they mentioned my name. Stet goes, I love Rick. Rick's like a brother. He goes, yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd, I'd like to have Rick in the band, play play with Rick. This is what I'm told. And and Carlos, I've worked with Carlos briefly uh, in 84, 85, when uh, Sin was in the recording studio. We were in Kendon Recording Studios in Burbank doing our, our album master demos. And somehow, I don't know how, Kevin DeBro got my phone number and called me up and said that they had just kicked Rudy out of the band. And they were getting ready. And he was like inebriated. Kevin was like three out of drunk, high, whatever. I, I thought it was a, a gag, a joke. He said, no, seriously, he goes, you got recommended. Uh, we've got a South American tour coming up and you were recommended. So I need you to meet with Frankie, get the tape of the set list. You're going to be working with Carlos to bring you up to speed. The only thing is we ask that uh, you don't tell anybody about this. I said, all right, fine. I'm sworn to silence. I met with Frankie, gave me the tape. Uh, I was going over Carlos's house and, and off Laurel Canyon. And we were so that was my brief working with them. Somehow the word got out. I don't know how. It might have been Dana Strom, who knows? Um, because he was producing us. And and I got I didn't get the gig. Uh I, I got a passport out of it. And and I, I when we were shooting the video in Reno, I asked Carlos about it. He goes, I have no idea what went down. I don't know how that happened. He goes, but here we are, we're working together now. So, so, you know, we all get along really well. Uh, we're all of the same mind. We're on the same page. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed and grateful to be in this position. This is something like a, you know, like a dream come true for me. Uh, you know, I've never, I, didn't, I haven't gotten to that level yet. So uh, this would be awesome. You know, uh, like I said, a blessing for me. Uh, Ronnie is a, an amazing songwriter. I've gotten to hear uh, some of his Miss Crazy stuff. 
And, and you know, he, he was in Amsterdam. He had Trixie. He had, uh, you know, he's connected with a lot of people in the business. He's released, I don't know, almost 20 something albums. But I, I didn't know who he was, you know, like that. And so we we, we talk all the time now and everything. And, and so uh, it worked out great. Uh, they flew me to to the site. You so you got the gig, and we haven't even played a note together yet. Right. You know, this is all on Greg's recommendation. You know, and then plus whatever Ronnie's seen of me on the internet and by playing here, playing there, work the stuff I've recorded on. Um, you know, I've, I've jammed with Sam Tennyson. I've jammed with Ronnie James Dio, but that wasn't on bass though. But you know, but I was connected anyway. So uh, it seemed like a, a natural fit, and they flew me to Reno a few months ago. And we did the video for You Shine. And we did another video, uh, which will be, I don't know when it's coming out. But uh, it, that was my first. I didn't know what songs we were going to record until I got there. You know, I haven't even had the album yet. Ronnie was playing me stuff in, in the car. We were driving back and forth from, to the to the studio. So when they had it, uh, they were running it through the, through the house sound system. So I, just, I plugged in the amp and I was just learning the song on the spot. Like that, because I got to know where I was going to put my hands on the neck, you know, uh, like that. So I just learned "You Shine" right before we recorded it. Yeah, so that was my that was my question. So they obviously were interested in you, and they reached out to you and made you an offer. But at what point did you hear the music and decide the music was a good fit for you? The only song I had heard that they had on YouTube was uh, "Loving You, Loving Me," mm -hmm. and it, you know, it's it. it so that kind of gave me an idea of what the style was but then I, I could when when i got to reno and we were driving from the airport to the studio or to take a, a dinner break ronnie was playing this stuff on a, on a cd in his car running it past us and i then i started to hear a little bit more of the diversity of the material and and me because i've been exposed to so much music over my life i can hear stuff in anybody's song and go Oh, that sounds like this, or that sounds like that, or like when Greg Chase on sent me his, his Atomic King stuff. Automatically, I said, "Well, I hear Deep Purple this song in here. I hear Gr Grand Funk here. I hear this. I hear." This. And Greg's like, "Well, we wear our influences on our sleeves." Yeah, and I'm, I'm the same way. I always admit I, I got this idea from here, from there. So, you know, I'm, I'm listening to the album. And I'm like, okay, so get it ready. Reminds me of it's right out of the school of Motley Crue, Dokken. Mm -hmm. That kind of, I don't know if you've heard the album yet or not. Yeah, I have. Um, Wendy, which is dedicated to uh, Ronnie's wife, Wendy, reminds me of Wasp. Yeah. It's just heavy in your face like Wasp. Uh, you Shine. Um, there is some, I hear 60s psychedelic arrangements in there. Mm -hmm. um, I hear some the, the, enough's enough, which would fit that bill. Yeah, and I, 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 I did an interview not long ago with with Chip. I wasn't really that familiar with Enough's Enough. Mm -hmm. The closest thing that I've heard that sounded like that was Electric Boys. If you remember their yeah. album. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. they had that 60s kind of psychedelic thing in there. And Ronnie's got a signature in his vocal style that I, I heard recently on some of his Miss Crazy stuff. He's got this haunting wail. This, ah, you know, and it raises the hair up on my arms. Goes right at my neck, mm -hmm. and that's what he he, he does it in, in that he does it in a, in a, in a another couple of songs too. Uh, so shall it be, is a is a song written to dedicated to Jesus, so it's like in the vein of Striper, right? The message okay. lyrically is 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 it's about Jesus. Uh, it's a heavy. It's kind of to, like a to me. I hear a seventies Steppenwolf kind of groove in that, and and I I was fan of Steppenwolf since 1968. Right? That was my first band I grew up, you know, really into was Steppenwolf at the age of 13. So I hear that 70s influence in it. Somebody else may hear something else in it. Um, MSM, which is mainstream media, is, is another really heavy cut. It's uh, It's got a galloping groove to it. Um, I don't know who that, that reminds me of. Um, Tell Me You Love Me then takes a left hand turn, and it reminds me of Nirvana. It's very nineties. Mm. Okay. Something something about the vocal style and the arrangement. 
that reminds me a little bit of Nirvana. Um, wait, is that? Oh, OK. You're, I'm jumping ahead. I was going to say there's a song on there called uh, Is It You Hurt Me? It Hurts Me. It Hurts Me. Yeah. Um, I heard I heard, believe it or not, some psychedelic furs in that song. Okay. I heard, especially in the vocal. Um, so it, to me, it was a real odd, strange mix that worked, but it was almost like this sort of, uh, psychedelic furs vocal over an 80s style sort of music, you know, and it worked really well. It blended well, but that vocal on that particular song stood out more. So it, Ronnie's voice sounded much more out of character on that song than it did as far as the rest of the songs. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now being exposed to the music that I was exposed to, when I hear it hurts me, it takes me back to 1975 in Max's Kansas City. That's like something I would hear on the jukebox there. Yeah. You know, and they had and all the local bands had whoever had a record out was on that jukebox. And I hear Lou Reed's Sweet Jane mm -hmm. mixed with Bowie's Heroes. Yeah. It, it's that vocal. There's there's something. What's the guy's name from Psychedelic Furs? Uh, I don't I don't know them that well. Uh, oh God, somebody's somebody's going to mention this in the comments. I, I've got his name on the tip of my tongue, but he's got that very haunting sort of deep sort of, you know, Bowie Lou Reed type vocal. Exactly. I love so, yeah. the Psychedelic Furs, but I couldn't name you three songs. Is it Richard Butler? Could be. You guys, you guys wouldn't know. Okay. Know. Anyway, someone will someone will mention it in the comments. Yeah, we'll get fried yeah. for that. That's okay. <laughs> so, so, but, but that's what I hear is that that. Well, we um, when I had when Sin was a, a cover band back in Jersey in the seventies, we did the Martha Hoople version of Sweet Jane uh -huh. of their their live medley. So, yeah. but it's still the same arrangement, you know. And and so I that's why I hear Sweet Jane meets Bowie's Heroes. Yeah. And you said Ronnie's voice is very kind of haunting in that. Yeah. And he was yeah. singing along to it in the car. And he and he, he looked he wondered, he goes, Bowie. And I went, Yes, exactly. Bowie. I hear that. Yeah. Uh, in there. Um, I hear that. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like a well rounded uh rock record with all of these cool uh sort of like time travel, you know, influences. Yeah. Is there definitely some kind of throwbacks in there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if that was conscious. When he wrote it, I, I, Ronnie would be the guy who can ultimately answer all of those questions yeah. as far as the arrangements. Um, like I said, uh, I came in learning th the bass patterns of what Greg had played in there. And then before the album was released, I called up Greg. I said, can you tell me exactly? I'm, I'm trying to catch what you're playing in this song. He goes, Rick, when they sent me that, it was no titles. It was it was just bass and, and rhythm. I mean, uh, drums and rhythm guitar, because I couldn't tell you what song was what. Wow. Yeah. You know, until now, he's got a copy of it. So I like well, that. I think that, you know, I, I'm glad you're kind of going track by track and, and bringing this up because I, I'm trying to explain to people that may not have heard it. And it definitely has an 80s rock sound, but I could definitely hear the 70s influences. And I'm glad you brought up Striper because. I heard some Doc in, I heard some Wasp. Uh, I didn't hear Striper until you said the name, and then I absolutely hear Striper. And uh, so I think fans of any of that stuff, I might I heard a little bit of Rat. So any fans of any of that type of music, I think we're are going to find plenty to like on this Freak Show album. Yeah, and then, then he takes a another right hand turn on uh, Ice Cold Hands, which is like right out of Rob Zombie. Yeah, it's yeah. all it's, it's you know it's tuned down to D. It's pretty much all run down on on the E string. It's tuned down to D, uh, and it's I hear a little bit of zombie in that. Um, yeah. uh, full on shred is this Carlos's moment to, to to let it go shine. Right, right. You know the, the instrumental. Yeah, and and to me, I hear a cross between uh, Michael Schenker's Into the Arena meets um, uh, Iron Maiden. It's just that kind of locomotive. Can I confess? Yeah. I have not heard the record, but you're by what you just said, that's got to be my favorite song. Instrumental? <laughs> just because you said Into the Arena sound and Iron Maiden, I'm like, in, yeah, in where do I that. sign up for that <laughs> shit? Well, you know, uh, the, the joke is, uh, what in doubt, go to F sharp. And, and, sure. and full, full on shred is in F sharp. 
So it was, you know, da, 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 a double bass kick, da, 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 da. and I'm listening to, to set through, through my cans, through my headphones. And, and again, the hairs are going up. I'm, I'm locking in with, with Stet on this. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm we're just waiting for the moment we get into a room and play together. Because it's, it's just going to be like like sticking your fingers in a socket. Yeah. You know, to actually do all this together. I'm uh, glad uh, we got you like before, you know, this sort of interim, before you have actually gotten in the, you know, started rehearsals with them technically. Hmm. And hear your reaction and how excited you are about this. You know, there are, there are cool. several things I think that, that came into play to underscore what you just said. Um, we left my wife and my late wife and I left L.A. in 2020. We sold our ranch. She had more background with Missouri because she was raised here mm. in Joplin and Springfield, uh, in St. Louis. I know nothing about Missouri, but she has roots here. Mm-hmm. So. This was one of the places we came to look at. She was a, a, a horse trader, equestrian. Wow. So we had horses. We needed horse property. Mm-hmm. So we this was the last place we looked at was the place we picked that we, we have here now. But there's not much of at least no metal, no hard rock music scene here. Yeah. You know, the closest clubs are Springfield. It's 80 miles away from me. It's wow. like an hour each way. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, and the closest thing to 80s rock is a band called Machine Gun Symphony. Uh, they're an 80s tribute band. Yeah. And the singer, Jay Stevens, is also an on-air personality at one of the radio stations in Springfield. Okay. So he's already got a built-in following. He's the only guy in the band who was in L.A. in the late 80s. So he's the only other L.A. hip guy here besides me. And and he, say, he says, this is, I agree, there's nothing out here for you. You know, I, I've tried to put out ads. I've, I've included pictures of some of the people I've played with. He says, you're going to scare people. There's nobody on your level, on our level in, in, in Missouri. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not the seventies, eighties anymore. So all those clubs are gone. So I'm just sitting here climbing the walls going, what am I going to do? My wife passed away last year. And, Sorry. and thank you. Uh, uh, she, the cancer came back and took her. And now I'm here by myself. And I'm like, all right, now what am I going to, what's next Lord? What do I, where do I go now? Call Vias. What's, what, what's next? And, and I think her spirit energy may have something to do with this, that, that kind of, she wanted me to go back into music, but there was nothing here. It's, you know, there's nothing in Branson. That's all like family entertainment. Mm-hmm, right. And Branson's like two hours away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's dinner theaters and things like that. Yako Smirnoff, uh, uh, Dolly Parton, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. There's nothing really. For, so, it's a it's a blessing. It's got to be divine intervention that I got this gig with Freak Show. Yeah. So, that, so the my... obvious question now is the album's out and you're you're putting out videos and the band is all you know revved up and ready to go. What do you do now? Is there are there tour plans in the works or at least some some you know live gigs here and there that you're trying to piece together? Uh, well, tell us about live yeah. performances. Uh, I, that's probably more of a Ronnie question because he, he would know, uh, being the band leader, he knows what's going on. You know, he's, t- uh, tied it closer with the label and whatnot. Um, I think as far as I know, Stet is going to be doing the band business as far as bookings and things like that. Uh, he's just coming off of middle church now. Uh, Ronnie told me last night they were in Virginia and, and he's, I guess, finishing up with that and he's making connections. Or, or has connections and working on shows, I think that will probably be, you know, in the next year, in, in 2024. I mean, nobody's really touring it though in the winter. Yeah. You know, there's right. no shows going on in the winter. Um, I, I think Ronnie expressed interest in, in going out, opening for supporting for Queensryche, but they just announced their tour coming up and Armored Saint got the opening slot, the support slot. Right. right. So that's, that's dashed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know what, they're handling the business. So I'm the new guy. I'm the bass player. And it's up to them, whatever, you know, they want to do big shows. I mean, we've, you know, Ioni, Ionian Records is is billing this as a super group. So, right. it, you know, out of out of professional courtesy, I, I, I would think to Carlos and Stet, you know, that we've got to have some somewhere up the echelon level of 
chose to do, you know, not, not little clubs, little clubs, but bigger venues and, and like that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. You've got some names in the band for sure. You know, yeah. we have a, a, a friend here in Austin, Jason and I, a guy named Chris Jordan, who once played drums in Miss Crazy. I don't know what iteration or what time period or whatever, but I remember, you know, we're buddies. So we talk and and he mentioned that he was in this band, Miss Crazy, at some point. I never heard of the band. And uh, I've seen photos and I guess they did the face paint and that sort of thing, or at least when yeah. he was in the band. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Chris Jordan, but he's a drummer here in Austin and he's got some uh, some connection to Miss Crazy. Probably yeah. knows Ronnie. Well, uh, one of the other shows we did the other night, um, an interview, whatever, and they were, um, I think it was uh, Paulie, Paulie D on Hell Yeah Radio. And he, we did a, a, a world premiere of the whole album. And Ronnie and I got into the uh, the chat chat box thing. And he, so we were going you know, song by song like that. And then afterwards, he Paulie went right into uh, Miss Crazy, one of their albums. Mm-hmm. So it's my first time hearing Miss Crazy. And it sounded a lot like what's on the free show album. Yeah. Okay. You know, <laughs> you know, it, it's just some of the stuff was really heavy. A lot of it was catchy. There was eighties in it. Uh, I saw pictures of them in the white face. Yeah. Uh, the, the face makeup like that. Um, I think what Ronnie said, freak show started with him and Jeff Labar mm. out, of, out of Cinderella. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they put out that first freak show album. Because uh, uh, Paulie played some of the first Freak Show album too, which sounds a little bit like like this current album. Yeah, and, and Jeff and I were friends through Fred Corey, uh, and and they invited me to a show in L.A. and and, and Corey Jeff, uh, I mean uh, Fred put Jeff on the phone. Jeff goes, I don't know anybody in L.A. and everybody's pounding, uh, pestering uh, Fred Fred for passes. He goes, You want to be my guest? This guy could have picked anybody in a million people. He's, sure. <laughs> so Jeff LeBlanc, I was Jeff LeBlanc's guest at the Irvine Meadows show uh, for Cinderella. And, and so that's how Jeff and I got to be friends. We've been friends ever since. And, and, and Jeff, myself, and Billy Sheehan, we're all like mad scientists in the kitchen. We're like the chefs. <laughs> Built crazy cooking you know, things. And we posted on in Facebook what, what our latest compliments were what we just cooked in the kitchen. So, you know, Jeff... God rest his soul. He was like, he's a chef. He was like a really accomplished chef. Yeah. So, so yeah. we all had these, these little other things besides music in common that we're on the side. You know, like some of us are into guns or some of us into this, some of us into that. So, so, well, uh, anyway, freak show started with Jeff and Ronnie with those two. And they had uh, Frankie Benelli was in the band and Tony Franklin. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So, so we got some. I got some big shoes to fill here. Yeah. Between Tony Franklin and then Greg Chase on, I was like, "Boy, I'm just, I'm just so fortunate to to have this, you know, position." Yeah. Well, I hope all the pieces fall into place, and you get to get out there and do some road work and and play in front of some audiences. Um, you know, we we started by fast forwarding to the present, but now I want to rewind all the way to the to the beginning. Um, uh, you're, you're a New York guy. Um, and, and you grew up at a time when you were watching and photographing kiss in clubs in like 1973 and stuff like that. Right. That's a fact that that is true. And, and did you, were you, is it, did I read somewhere that Peter Chris gave you your first shag haircut? Absolutely did. You got it right. <laughs> right on the, right on the nose. Tell me about that. Well, um, the Criscola family were living in Williamsburg. I was in Greenpoint. Williamsburg is the next little town over. They happened to move of all places. It, it had to be kismet. It had to be fate, whatever you want to call it. Uh, a lot of places in Greenpoint had a bar on every freaking corner and you know, apartments up over the bar like that. And so they moved around the corner from me and lived upstairs over a bar. So they didn't have a backyard. You go out their kitchen window, and it was the roof of the parking structure below them. It was a one-level, one-story parking structure. That was their backyard, was this roof. And they go out and sit out there, you know, in the summertime. And so uh, I knew Peter before he was in Kiss. He was in Chelsea. Yeah. Right. Then called Chelsea. And then, because uh, when I started hanging out with the sisters, 
he had three sisters. Nancy was the oldest, Donna was the youngest, and Joanne was in the middle. Joanne was the one that I dated. And he said, well, our big brother, uh, and his this brother, Joey. Uh, he said, our big brother, Peter, he's a rock star. He's a rock star. Big rock star. And, and Peter dressed like Rolling Stones kind of a thing. John Lennon meets the Rolling Stones. He had that look about him uh, yeah. and, and like that. And so uh, when he got to put the ad in to the Village Voice uh, for a you know, drummer willing to do anything to make it, and he hooked up with Gene and Paul. So he got that gig. And so they were rehearsing at their loft on 23rd Street. And I was still in high school. This is like 72. I must have been about 17, maybe. Something no. like that. That was a, I was a sophomore or, or a junior in high school. And Peter was stopped by his, you know, his mom's place with, with Lydia's car. Yeah, she had a, a, a silver Chevy Nova. And he'd say, we're going into Manhattan. We're going to go rehearse. You want to come hang out? So we're wow. like, yeah. So me, the sisters, our friend Anne-Marie, uh, my friend John, John Alton from high school, we pile in the car and we get there. And that's my first exposure to smart-ass Gene Simmons, who was probably 25 at the time. Uh, I don't know if he was still teaching in, in school at that point. Mm -hmm. He worked for some companies that he had access to the mailroom, which is how they were mailing out all of their invites to people oh. in the industry. Uh, and Paul, smart-ass Paul. And we'd watch the three of them rehearse. Ace wasn't in the band yet. Right. And, wow. and one of the things I, I saw... Uh, on the side of Gene's SVT cabinet was the name Jack Bruce stenciled on it. Wow. He had actually bought off of you know, 48th Street in Manhattan was Music Row. All the guitar stores, you know, Banny's, Sam Ash, uh, uh, all of the guitars. So Gene must have bought one of Jack Bruce's old bass cabinets. Wow. That's what he was playing through. <laughs> and this was my first exposure to a lot of the songs we hear on the first Kiss album. Yeah. Like that in their infant, infant stage like that. And we just watched the three of them rehearsing like that for a while. And, you know, the, the loft wasn't that big, maybe, I don't know, 30 feet by 12, 30 by eight, uh, 15. And it had the egg cartons all over the walls to yeah. absorb the sound like that. And, uh, and at one point, you know, we, we didn't go there during their auditions, but the next time we went up there, uh, Ace Fraley was now already in the band. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They had they had auditioned Bob Kulick. They had auditioned uh, uh, JJ French. Uh, There's a lot of guitar plays they went through. Mm -hmm. uh, of, of course, you know Bob Kulick didn't want to shave his mustache uh, mm -hmm. like that. And it, it, anyway, so we go up there, and there's this guy in a gray pinstripe suit with an orange sneaker and a purple sneaker leaning against the wall. And he's playing. He's like Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page hooks, and pulls. Paul is uh, nudging him, get off the wall, come interact with us so they can do their moves, you know, their choreography, whatever, uh, like that. And then we were watching him rehearse. Now the ace is in the band. And my friend John would bring a six pack of Budweiser, which would get then get bummed off by ace every, uh, you know, John, can I have another beer? Can I have another one of your beers? Can I have another one of your beers? And he would drink all of John's Budweiser beers, you know, like that. And, and so that was our introduction to watching the beginnings of what became Kiss. Wow. And they didn't, have, they didn't even have a name yet. You know, and me being in, in high school, shrewd, s s sly guy that I was, managed to finagle a fake ID. And I would dress like them. I had satin pants and uh, uh, lyrics, sparkly tops. As I said, you asked me about Peter cutting my hair. Well, let me go back to that. Um, uh, Peter knew how to cut that kind of a hairstyle, the shag, what the shag haircut was. Yeah. That was introduced to the United States by Paul McGregor, who was a hairstylist out of the UK. Okay. And he had cut Jane Fonda's hair. If you remember, in Clute, she mm -hmm. had the shag haircut. Uh, Warren Beatty. Yeah. He was cutting yeah. all the movie stars' hairs. Well, the layered look was now coming in. Yeah. So Peter knew how to cut that style because he had that haircut. He says, go get me a pair of scissors and a, tall, a bud tall boy. I did. I got him a beer. I got him a scissors for my grandmother. And I sat there on the roof and the Criscola family's roof and he got a towel and he cut my hair in layers. And, and I go back to my house and my grandmother looked at it. She goes, it's too damn long. Cut it shorter. 
Uh, my grandmother was not hip. Uh, I went back to Peter. I said, she said, cut it short. He goes, what is she nuts? <laughs> and he just dabbled a little bit. Anyway, he gave me my first layered shank haircut. So he yeah. was kind of like, he was like a big brother to me that I never had. And you know, the, you know, the reason I ask is because that haircut kind of became your trademark. I mean, it did. throughout it did. all the phases of your career, if we see photos of you, you have some variation of that. You know, it might be longer or shorter, but it's still that shag layered thing. And it, and I wanted to find out if it started with Peter Chris. It, well, for me, it did. Yeah. That hairstyle over in England. If you remember the, the Rod Stewart and the Small Faces album, not as good as a wink. Yeah. On the back, it was the marionettes, and they had the hair sticking up like that in layers. They called it a rooster, because yeah. that's what Rod, Rod and Ronnie Wood had that layered rooster haircut. Right, right. It would stick up like that, and then as it fanned out, then you could see all the layers. So I was the only guy in high school that had that haircut. Yeah. I was wearing I was wearing platform <laughs> shoes. I'd spray glue on it and put glitter. So wherever I walked, I'd leave a trail of glitter behind me. Like pig pan and peanuts with the with the dust. It was Rick Fox just walking down the hall. There's the glitter, like that, and, and so that's where that came from. And as the layers grew, and I was emulating the bands I would see in New York. There's the Dolls, the yeah. Fast, uh, uh, Wayne County's band. Uh, um, who was it from from Detroit? Motor City Bad Boys. All these bands were coming with layered haircuts. Right. Okay. And and so I'm sitting in front of the Seagram's building on 52nd and, and Lexington. The Lexington Park. 52nd and Park. I had a messenger job out, out of high school. Right. And I'm sitting there on the steps, the famous Seagram's building with the fountains. And this girl comes walking by and she had the same haircut. And it's like we're like two aliens on another alien. We recognize each other because we have the same same kind of style. And, and so we started talking, and she says, have you ever been to Max's? I said, what's that? She goes, you never heard of Max's Kansas City? I said, no. She goes, well, I got to take you there. So right. we made a date. I met her at Max's, and she took me in, and that was my introduction to the rabbit hole. Wow. And I, I haven't looked back since. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, it's not a den of iniquity, but, um, you know, the Ramones are in there. Like I said, all these bands that I told you uh, uh, were Tough Darts. Uh, 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 Jane Wayne County, Jane County, uh, right. uh, ever all the, the 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 hip New York scene bands all hung out at Max's. Yeah, which started out as as um, uh, uh, an Andy Warhol place for right. his art crowd. Right, right. And as it, as it become more hip, the musicians were starting. Alice Cooper hung out there. David Bowie, Lou Reed, uh, uh, you know the 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 Dolls, all, and all of their their uh, entourages. Yeah. Iggy. And so, so Andy pulled out, and then it became the rock place. So, so I'm go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I was. I wanted to ask as someone who saw Kiss at such an early stage in their career. Um, so you were privy to something that uh, most people have never seen or heard or whatever. So when you're witnessing this as a young kid and you're watching these guys and you're watching uh, and then you're photographing them in the clubs and you're sort of watching the look evolve with the makeup and the costumes. Are you ever at one point thinking to yourself, this is either going to be the biggest thing in the world or it's so damn goofy, it's just going to crash and burn? Because it had to go one way or the other, right? It's a great question. So Most did you ever the, think that it was so silly that it was just going to fall flat? Or did you see that it was actually going to blast off and be huge? I was a, I was a kid in a, in a, in a toy store. Yeah. Uh, I was in awe of this. <laughs> I had There was no yardstick to compare this to outside mm -hmm. of Ziggy Stardust. Right, right. Okay, and maybe Mark Bowen. Yeah. You know, if they were just touching on the fringes of androgyny. Mm -hmm. Bowie, like that. Bowie had that haircut, too. And so... Most of the bands wore the, the, the over heavier feminine, you know, the eyeliner, the, the whoever, the, the maybe some color in the face, the, the make, like the dolls. Everybody looked like the New York dolls. Yeah. Except Kiss. Kiss took it to that other level, and they were like the kabuki character makeup. Mm -hmm. And there was just, like I said, there was nothing, there was no yardstick to compare this to. So there was to, to answer your question. I didn't. We none, none of us, at least that I know of, thought of it as goofy. We were just like, "Wow!" They it's were. Been... They were. 
characters. They were creatures. Yeah. They turned into these other, you know, these these monsters, if yeah. you will, on stage and played out these roles of the the, the characters of their makeup. Um, Gene, like myself, grew up into you know horror films, science fiction films. So uh, he told he said in and I talked about this recently. He said in an interview. He emulated his stage movements after the the the, the creature, the Emir creature from uh, uh, Twenty Thousand Miles to Earth, the the, the, the dinosaur from Venus. Mm-hmm. We were fans of, of Ray Harryhausen's uh, stop motion animation. Mm. So Gene emulated Ray Harryhausen's stop motion creatures that would move that way. You know, not not familiar with their surroundings and taking it all in, and then being a monster and then stepping back and taking. So I know where he got that from, you yeah. know, and Paul, of course, wanted to be the rock star. Peter liked cats. So he became the cat character and Ace was the spaceman. So I got it. I, I from my young age, I got where they were coming from like that. Yeah. And, and so um, when I got introduced to Max's and I was introduced to this, one of the many guitar players that were there, he had a group called the Marshall Rock Band. His name was uh, uh, Sebi Castle. Today they know him as Sebastian Black. He's a, a stage magician in New York. Uh, he did psychic medium. He does all that stuff. And and we got to talking. And and I, looking back, it seems like a lot of my gigs, I was brought in to replace somebody else, whatever bass player they had. They said, you know, you've got this look. You've got this. There was something about Rick that he brought something else to the table that they didn't have in their band. That's how my interpretation of his looking right. back. And he says, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to have you in our band. And I was not a very good bass player at that point. I was still learning my way around the neck. Right. Uh, there's a, it's a joke that I was the green bass player, which will come into play because it was literally, I was green. Yeah. Uh, Sammy was very, pa- he was very patient with teaching me the songs. And, and what the positions were, uh, kind of like people say about Nicky Six when he first picked up his bass, he didn't know how to how to play it. Right. I had the bass. I was trying to learn down my basement. I would play along with records. I didn't know what A, G, D, E, chords. I didn't know what that was. I was just trying to find those spots on the neck and play it as best. So Sebi taught me all of the, the, fund- the elementary fundamentals of that. And the songs in the Martian Rock were relatively easy. Stuff you know, fifties doo wop, space meets uh, that kind of fifties feel to it. So a lot of it was uh, similar patterns. And and I he invited me to come watch them play live with their his current lineup. Yeah. And and there just wasn't that much visual for a band named the Martian Rock Band. Right. Uh, the drummer wore a silver lame jumpsuit of space. I've got a suit. Sebi had a, a purple uh, 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 um, bodysuit, uh, uh, like a coveralls. There really wasn't that much going on in the band. So uh, I had to figure out what role would I play besides a bass player in this kind of a band. And I drew upon my influence of Kiss mm-hmm. and the science fiction movies, things like that. So the opening song was called Take Me to Your Leader. <laughs> And as there's stops in the song where he introduces each member of the band, like, and mine is, he goes, the bass player, he's from Mercury, the drummer, he's from here. And I'm the greatest magician in the galaxy. You know, I'm going, I'm going, so what am I supposed to be? And I sat down at a little vanity mirror in my basement. And I started to experiment. If you remember the scene in the crow where, where uh, Jason Lee's character comes back and he's sitting at the mirror and he looks at the, at the, uh, at the uh, um, uh, the Mary uh, the the the, uh, the mask, it's his 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 girlfriend's uh, drama comedy mask, and he starts putting on the makeup like that, and I went and I got um, a bunch of this silver cream eyeliner, frosted highlight green, and it was just like a a sparkly green color, and I went to Capizio in New York, which is a ballet supply store. And they sell spandex bodysuits. So I got a black spandex bodysuit. I, I turned around so the zipper opened in the front. And all of my skin that was exposed, I, I colored in this green frosted cream 
my face, my neck, my, my chest. <laughs> and because my favorite universal monster was the creature from the Black Lagoon, I tried to go kind of in that direction. Like if you could imagine the creature coming from another planet. So I took a black eyeliner pencil and I sat there and I drew scales on my exposed skin. <laughs> and I used blue above the eyes. I did the eyebrows like Spock and I covered them with Dermawax. And I redrew them up and I had rhinestones and I, I just, I just go overboard passionate with whatever I'm doing. I just dive like a dump truck full of concrete into it. <laughs> and I put rhinestones and I copied Ace, Ace's costume from the cover of the uh, Kiss Alive. And yeah. he's got these shooting stars with, with uh, rhinestones. Yeah. So I did, I did that. I had these silver platform boots. Um, and I, I used uh, streaking tips. And I hit a little, a little bit of silver in my hair. My hair was auburn at the time. It was like a reddish brown auburn. I was doing a, 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 a henna. I used to color my hair with henna. And, and that's kind of what my character was. And I show up at the loft. We had our own rehearsal loft. The whole building was all bands. And I introduced this character to, to Sebi. He's like, we, don't have, we never had anything like this. You've just upped the bar. Now I have to do something to match that. <laughs> and he, would, he came up with a you know, facial design of his own. The drummer had to come up. We had a new drummer. He had to come up with something. So now we hit the stage. And we're like a space age version of Kiss, yeah, three piece, yeah. And that was that was kind of what we what we did. I introduced that that character that way, and and I, I started to understand the mindset, the freedom, like Kiss had. When you put that makeup on, you're somebody else. Yeah, you're you're yeah. a character. You're not who you are without the makeup, so people recognize you. You're you now kind of have this license to be this other fantasy character. Like right. that, and then when you take the makeup off, you're you. You're, you're totally somebody different. What you know? kind of uh, what kind of level did you did that band uh, get to as far as you know bigger venues or touring or opening for cool bands or how? Yeah, we 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 didn't get to a, a higher high level. Okay, we played Max's several times uh, cool. on one of the shows. We opened for Blondie. Cool. Who was just just up and coming? We played CBGBs several times. Uh, two years before ACDC played there, they played there in 77, mm -hmm. played there in 75, 76. Um, we were just opening for other, other bands. However, the, they, the club bookers booked them and put us on the bill. We were, you know, either, either at the bottom or in the middle somewhere or like that. And it was still all a learning curve for me. Yeah. I was just wide eyed going, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and I started thinking, what else can we bring to the table? Sebi was a big fan of sci-fi. I was a big fan of sci-fi. We had pictures on the wall of Commander Cody and the from the Rocket Man with the the bullet helmet and the jetpack. Uh, pictures from Earth, uh, uh, um, um, Day the Earth Stood Still, things like that. Now, in the back of the comic books in the magazine, the Monster, the famous Monsters of Filmland, was a big magazine at the time. Yeah, Forrest J. Ackerman ran that magazine. They would have these ads where you could buy little five-minute spools of eight-millimeter film. Of various scenes from like the Wolfman, the creature, Dracula, whatever the movie was. You could, you know, if you were like maybe $5.99, you'd get like four or five minutes of this this film on a spool. My dad had a, an eight millimeter movie projector. So I remember seeing old pictures from the Fillmore East. They would have these light shows because everybody was dropping acid. And they had an overhead projector back by the soundboard, and they would project it onto a screen over the band. And they would mix these different chemicals, these oils, and they would move them around like bubbles. So people were tripping out and looking at this light show and like that. So I adapted that. And we'd put up a, a screen behind us and I'd bring my dad's movie projector. And I had spools from uh, Day the Earth Stood Still and, and you know, Commander Cody. And, uh, and I would have, we'd have it work. So if the drummer was doing something, or Seppi was doing something in guitar, I could run quick behind there and spool up the next film and get back and put my bass on like that. And we were showing movies, science fiction movies on a screen behind us. That's cool. There was nobody doing that back then. Yeah. So I, I'm like an idea man. I, I get totally 
and and meshed in what I'm doing. I go, what else can we do? What else can we do? Well, you know, and I was bringing these things to the table that nobody else was doing. So, so, and people were noticing. Um, ultimately, the band broke up because uh, Sebi had given our rent money to the drummer to go pay the landlord, like everybody in the building. Had, and he took off with the money, I guess, bought drugs and disappeared. We never saw him again. So we didn't have the money to keep the loft open because we didn't pay the rent. And the band just broke up. And that was that. Was that. But no, now I knew everybody in Max, so I'm looking for gigs. Right. Like that, you know, and, and being part of the scene. So what year did you end up in Los Angeles? Yeah, that's what I was. Yeah. Tell us about that. Okay. So uh, through 1980, 81, I was playing the Jersey club circuit like six nights a week, four or five sets a night with a group called the E. Walker Band. You're literally a live jukebox. We played everything from Joe Jackson to Judas Priest, The Who, mm-hmm. The Doors, Kiss, Alice, whatever. And and Twisted Sister was doing that in Long Island. We were doing it in Jersey. And uh, uh, after I got out of, we, we toured Toronto for about a week under the name Spitfire. And we got back. Uh, I was getting ready to leave the band. Uh, these guys smoked a lot of pot. I didn't smoke. So I was never kind of in the groove with the rest of the guys. Right. I was the, I was the, I was the outsider guy. Anyway, I got introduced to this other guitar player through the girl, my girlfriend at the time met this guitar player's girlfriend and we hit it off. His name was Dave Ferrara. Dave, this is now the first time shrapnel records comes into the picture. Dave was one of the guitar players that Mike Varney was spotlighting uh, uh, on his uh, U.S. Metal series. Right. On, he's on U.S. Metal 4. Uh, and so he had a song on the album. And we met. We got along really well. He was like an Eddie Van Halen kind of a guitar player. And so we put a band together called Aggressor. And we were playing the clubs. Uh, and we were doing like Van Halen, Iron Maiden, Scorpions, Rush, Zeppelin, no, all the heavier stuff. Right. And my day job, I was working on 8th Street in Manhattan, just a few doors up from Electric Lady Studios. And these kids came in who were vacationing from L.A. They said they came to New York to see Twisted Sister play at some festival. So the conversation goes, you know, well, I, I know Twisted Sister. They're friends of mine. I've known Mark Mendoza since the dictators. I know Ross the Boss. I know these guys. And, and they used to come and hang out with us when my band scene was rehearsing in New York. Like, wow, you know Twisted Sister? These guys are like gaga. Yeah, it's no big deal. And then we talked about Kiss, like I talked to you. And they, wow, you know the guys in Kiss too? These guys were big fans. And they said, well, you obviously look like a rock star. Yeah, I I had the Punky Meadows look at this time. My my, my hair was identical to Punky Meadows. Right. And and they said, well, what do you do? And I said, I'm a bass player. And they said, we know a band in California that's looking for a bass player. And you look like you would fit in perfect. I said, listen, when you go to try out for a band, it's usually in a reasonable driving distance. To to think of auditioning for a band on the other side of the country was just beyond my scope to to, to, to accept something like that. But they asked me for some contact information. I had a a picture in my bag of me on stage with uh, E. Walker, I think it was, and a phone number. And I gave it to him, and that was it. I never saw or heard from him again. I figured, you know, whatever, in one when one year out the other. About a month later, I started getting phone calls um, um, from this guy in California in Blackie Laws. So these kids actually made good on their word, and they handed off my picture and the phone number to Blackie. And they must have talked me up to him or something. <clears throat> and, and so over a series of several phone conversations with Blackie, he convinced me to, you know, to come out to California and try out for his band's sister because it wasn't Wasp yet. And so uh, they paid my way. I brought my bass and I, I tore up the, the cushions on one of my couches and wrapped them as padding around a couple of bass heads and, and a little bag of clothes. And that was all I had with me. And I, I get to the airport in LAX and, and they came to pick me up. Blackie was there, uh, Randy Piper, Tony Richards. And Mike Solon, who was Blackie's driver, because Blackie's car was was uh, wasn't running, 
So Mike was essentially his driver to go everywhere. Now, trivia people, Mike Solon is the bartender in the Wasp video, Blonde in Texas. Uh-huh. And they come in and say, we're here to play a gig. And he goes, what's the gig? Yeah. And he goes, and he pours a drink on the bar and it's like acid. That yeah. bartender, that's Mike Solon. He was our driver. <laughs> and he was the one to pick us up and bring us to rehearsal all the time. So they 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 picked me up. Uh, Mike drove me and Blackie back to Blackie's house in Hollywood. Randy and Tony took my gear to Randy's studio in, in Anaheim. Because uh, Randy had a huge industrial building that all these other bands would rehearse in, including whatever he was doing. And so that's kind of how I got to California was 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 through Blackie and, and the guys in the band. And um, but the audition process took over two days, two, two days, I think it was. I got there February 4th of 82. And so I started auditioning on the 6th and then again on the 8th because it, it was only five songs. They weren't that hard. But sitting there watching them go through the, the songs took me back in my mind to being in the loft watching Kiss. Yeah, it was that kind of power, mm-hmm. energy. These guys are like nothing. Every once in a while, a band will come along. It was like nothing you've ever seen before, or maybe hints of one other band. And they reminded me of Kiss, the the, the arrangements, the structure, the power, the energy, and of course, Blackie had that unique singing style in his voice. Yeah, almost like that, like Lemmy style. Yeah, singing. <clears throat> and and so he used to get up. You and I plugged in and I went through the songs with them. So after the second audition, he said, you got the gig. And, and that's, that's kind of how I got the gig. And um, I'd say probably a month into that is when uh, I stepped on, on the, the bug in the courtyard. Oh yeah. I was kicked, I, I've, I have, I've read about this. Yeah. yeah. I had a phone call from a friend in New York. Black had a really long extension on his flight, a princess phone. And I went outside. I'm, I'm kicking leaves over in the yard. It was avocado tree. I'm kicking leaves over, and I stepped on what I thought was a yellow jacket. And it was still it was still moving. The, ting- the stinger in the tail was moving. And it reminded me of the old Green Hornet logo from the TV show. Yeah. So I go back in the house. He's, he's like he's slumped like this on the couch. And he's watching the Yankee game on TV. And he had said that this is now a whole new band. He doesn't know where he's going to go with this band, what he's going to call it, what we're going to look like. He didn't know, had any idea now that the band was, was complete. And I said, I got an idea for a band name. And he goes, because it was still sister. And he says, what? And I said, wasp. I said, I just stepped on a wasp outside in the courtyard. And I told him about, you know, the stinger and the tail. Movement. And he looks at the sailing and he's thinking, he's thinking. He goes, that's a good idea. He goes, keep thinking like that. The next other night, that we had rehearsal after we're done, he gets all of us together and he says, we got a new name for the band. And, and Randy goes, well, I want to call a band Hellion because that's what they call bad kids in Texas. Cause that's where he's from Texas. <laughs> and I said, I think there already is a band in Hollywood called Hellion. So Tony says, well, what's the name? Blackie goes, Wasp. And Tony goes, Wasp? Who needs a band after a bug? <laughs> and I said, Scorpions? Beatles, you know, the Beatles, that was my next <laughs> one. Yeah. And black Hills, that's the name of the band. So we're now going to be called wasp and that's it. And that's how it was born. So technically all four of us are the new co-founding members of a new band called wasp. Wow. Wow. At that point. And then Blackie gets on the phone, calls Don Atkins, a photographer. we got a good band. we got a new band, a good bass player. That's great. You come here. We got to do a photo session. So we booked a photo session. We shot at Don Atkins house where he shot Motley Crue. And we did the band pictures. And then we hit, we had time to do a demo. So we got a reel to reel. We put it on the floor in the, in the rehearsal room. Blackie would hit start, record, run back, pick up his guitar. And we, we, we did, I, I was writing with them at this point. We did six songs on the first demo. It was stuff you hear on the first album, minus Master of Disaster, which is a song that I, was co- I co-wrote with them. You know, it was BAD, Sleeping in the Fire, uh, Hell, uh, Hell, 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 Hellion, yeah. Hellion. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, School Days. That was, it was five songs plus that other one. And we've got a really fucking kicking demo. 
And and uh, I was friends with a lot of the label people back in New York because we all hung out at Gildersleeves. And I was dating a girl uh, who worked at Electra who was friends with a guy who worked at A&M, it was Hernando Cartwright. Hernando's dad used to own the ho- uh, Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And, and Hernando worked at A&M Records. So before I went to L.A., I consulted with Hernando. I said, I got an offer to go to L.A. What do you know about L.A.? He told me, he showed me uh, uh, EPs on his desk of Snow, which is called Scavazzo's Band. Yeah. Uh, he showed me the Motley Crue, the first pressing of the Motley Crue EP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like that. He maybe maybe a copy of the Motley Crue album on on a de- on a tape. So I knew the whole album before he even got to L.A. Wow. He goes, this band is great. This is a new big thing in L.A. It's Motley Crue. You gotta hear this. So he says, if you get into something, can you give me write a first refusal? Let me hear it first before you bring it to anyone else. I said, okay, fine. I call it. Hernando was coming. He was in L.A. He was at the A and M Studios on La Brea, uh, uh, up by by Sunset. I said, we got a tape. Can we come by? And he said, yeah, come on. So we sat down in his office. We played the demo. He liked it. But at, at that point, you know, in in, uh, in 82, everybody's looking for radio songs. What's, I need hits. We need hits. He didn't hear any hits on the tape. So Blackie was kind of, dip, you know, dip, dip, uh, uh, disappointed about that. Uh, but I still was a, it was a killer tape. Yes, I mean, like that. half of that ended those, up on the fir- being the first album. That first album is amazing. Yeah, so. those songs are they, even the ones you were involved with that you mentioned. That's half the record. I yeah, love that start. fucking record. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, by the end of May, he came up to me when he stopped talking to me. Was getting, I was staying at Blackie's house. It was getting really awkward. It was, we were not conversing anymore, mm-hmm. and I don't know what mm-hmm. was wrong. Mm-hmm. He sits down one day, he goes, well... We need to talk. <clears throat> so Tony's not happy. Randy's not happy. He goes, you're out of the band. Why? What? Happened? He goes, it's just not working. There was no real tangible reason. He just kept saying it's not working out. Nobody's happy. I'm like, you were happy with the demo, yeah. you know, and, and like that. And, and the other thing that, that caught my ear was he said, you have to surrender all your copies of the band pictures. Why? Mm-hmm. It's my band and my pictures. I paid for him. He knew what he was doing by, yeah. by cutting me out of the picture, so to speak. And if I had not uh, borrowed the negatives and gone up to Sunset Boulevard and made more copies, I would never have any proof that I was in the band. Yeah. So that was- when, I got, when I got back to the house, he, he blew a gasket. He goes, give me them fucking pictures. Those are mine. He's yelling and screaming at me, you know, like like redhead stepchild. So I had luckily tucked a few away, and because he saw the negatives were gone. So I'm now at a wasp, and how am I ever going to prove this that I was I was with these guys? And and uh, at one point, my copy of the demo, I, I took a, a a flare pen, like a like a sharpie, and I I had a, a I took the cassette flap, and I made a generic album cover, just for my own edification. I, I, I reduced the band picture. I put it on there and I wrote it by hand. You know, the, I drew up a logo. I called it uh, uh, the album Face the Attack. And I drew, I put our names, you know, who we are and what we played on it and the list of the songs. I was doing a between places to live. I was staying at somebody's apartment in North Hollywood. And the girl who I was going out with, her car got stolen from the parking structure. Underneath the building, there was no security gate. I think it was a setup. Um, we found the car a few months later. All of my milk crates with the albums of bands I worked with that had signed the albums. I said these new lights for bands in, in New York. Um, those were all gone. Whatever was in the car was stolen. Whatever was in the trunk was still there. Half my record collection was still there. But that wasp tape was in the back seat in one of the milk crates. Mm -hmm. somebody must have recognized the value of that thinking that it was an official album because even though it was hand drawn and face the attack the wasp on it and it that it got bootlegged pirated whoa that was a real big thing in the 80s was bootleg tapes tape traders it still is now yeah it went around the world so many times that by the time i got a copy of it back because my my copy is right off the master it was really good clarity. By the time I wound up getting a copy of it, it had been dubbed so many times. It was 
you, you couldn't hear all the details as much in it anymore. Mm-hmm. But the fans, un, unsuspecting fans, are now thinking this is like an official bootleg wasp demo. And they all refer to it as the face the attack demo. Wow. There's no such official release. I keep telling them, yeah, it's it's my own personal copy. There was no yeah. <laughs> demo with that name on it. Wow, but that's kind of legendary, man. That's how it happened. Yeah. yeah. And and even though it has my name and picture on it, I can't tell you how many Wasp fans are so hostile towards me and they don't acknowledge the fact that that's me on the demo. Mm. And so there that... are people there are people like from Russia or whatever that have re-uploaded these onto YouTube going, look at this mystery wasp demo. You know, like that. And I said, that's much made off of my de- my original tape. That's mine. That's not no unknown wasp demo like that. And it's, I had to have to keep chasing people, and they don't believe me. They think I'm a, I'm a BS artist. So because Black Blackie does not recognize, will not acknowledge that I was in the band. Right. So so that's I, I have two more questions on Wasp, and then I want to move on because we we've got so much to cover, and I definitely want to get to Steeler. But so my my first question uh, on with Wasp. First of all, did you did you play any gigs with the band or were you out of the band before the band was actually on the club scene? And number two, what would be what what is Blackie's motive for sort of disowning you or pretending that you were never a part of the band? And to add to that, why aren't you credited on the first Wasp album for writing half the fucking record? Great question. Those are all great questions. Uh... I've seen people try to corner Blackie with specific questions regarding me. And he, he, next question. He will mm, not, yeah. he will not address it. He will avoid it. He's very um, clever in his ways of, of sidestepping, having to answer direct questions because the people don't know how to ask the right questions that I oh, would yeah. know. Yeah. If you put me and him together in a room, you hear the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, to answer your first question, I was out before they did any gigs. Okay. I was out and they got Don Costa in, uh, who they were looking at before me. I found out later from Donnie, he did not want to play with Blackie. Blackie had some kind of reputation uh, for, for he's a bully. He's, he's a control, controlling bully guy, which yeah. Randy had, and Tony have, and Chris all have verified later on in the years. Um, so they wound up going back and getting Don Costa in the band. They did one or two shows with him and they kicked him out. Then it's when Blackie went over to bass. Right. Uh, Donnie did one show, I think, with Ozzy Osbourne. And then Ozzy like, punched him in the face or something, broke his nose. Um, and then Donnie disappeared. So there was that. So that's how I was. Then I was out of the band. Wait a minute. I thought Blackie was the bully and he got punched out by Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> no, no, Don, Don Costa got. Don Costa. Oh, I know. By Ozzy Osbourne hit Don. And we, anyway, at the, a second ago, who was the bully? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, as the stories get relayed to me, I don't know. Uh, you know, some bands, they tape off a square area and you're supposed to stay in that area. Hmm. And, you know, when Ozzy would come up to the front of the stage, Donnie would come up to the front of the stage. You're not allowed to do that, I find out. Mm, You're not supposed to upstage the the, the people's attention off of the star. Right, right. right. And Donnie was doing that. The boss. The boss. Right. And (laughs) apparently Sharon Osbourne had warned him not to do that. And he went behind her back and he was actually laughing about it, going, look at me, I'm in front of Ozzy. Something like, you know, something along those lines. And Ozzy got mad at him and, and bopped him. Mm. <laughs> no, I think that's that's how that happened. Um, so, what do you think is his motive, Blackie's motive, for trying to erase you from Wasp's history? And then to Jason's question, why are you not accredited? Yeah, that's kind of the album? same question, isn't it? This kind of turns it into one question. What yeah. I was told, this is coming right from Randy, who will, who will now categorically deny it. Mm, After it's the Wasp show at the Troubadour. Uh, Because I was still friends with with Tony and Randy. After the show at the Troubadour, with the flames going up to the ceiling, the wasp sign, there was an after party at, um, what the hell was the name of the hotel? Everybody used to go there. It was was on on, the Sunset Boulevard. 
there's a big after party. And I have a picture of Randy and I sitting on, on this bed. And, I, and uh, he, he, he goes, I'll tell you why you got kicked out of the band. He says, everybody in town knows Blackie. He's kind of like used goods. He says, you're the new guy. You came in from New York. You have this mystique about you. People, don't, we don't know anything about New York except what we read in the rock magazines. There's no internet back then. So he says, your look, he says, you know, you go to the, to the rainbow or whatever, and you meet girls. And, you know, everybody who's been at the rainbow knows that at 2, 2 a.m., it all spills out into the parking lot. Right. And it's, it's the whole rainbow parking lot hookup thing. And being new in town, a girl here or a girl there would find me, I guess, attractive or whatever, want to go home with them. So they'd, I'd go to their house or whatever like that. This one girl came back to Blackie's with me. I did not know this. This is what Randy said. He goes, you were bringing a girl back to the house that had, he'd already tried to pick up earlier in the evening. And she told him no. <laughs> Here's you showing up a couple hours later with the same girl that told him no. That's like rubbing it in his face. <laughs> so that ain't going to happen more than twice. Okay. And it's, it happened twice. I had brought a, a girl, just a different girl, back to the house that somebody he'd already been with before I even got to L.A. And so Randy said, that's what got you fired. He says, Randy, Blackie was not going to stand for you bringing a girl back to the house that already told him no earlier in the evening. That's well, like, he could have no. said something about that instead of the blame it on the other guys not being happy without any call for reason. If he was that kind of person. Oh, okay. I've I've okay. read uh, uh, interviews with Chris Holmes years later that Blackie, when Chris was dating Lita Ford, she invited to go him to go with her to this Rock Awards, and Blackie forbade Chris to go. And Chris said, "Why?" And Blackie allegedly said, "Because I'm jealous." This had come out later in other interviews where they other uh, members had said Blackie is extremely jealous, and he does not like. Anybody taking that attention away from him? Mm -hmm. uh, there's an interview Randy did with Full and Blue Music where they said, was Rick in the band? And they said, yeah, Rick was in the band for a short time. We were looking at a lot of people, but Rick played with us for a while. And they said, did Rick come up with the name Wasp? And he said, Randy goes, undoubtedly, I'm not going to take that away from him. He says, Rick did come up with the name Wasp. He goes, he goes, Blackie put the periods in it, stole it from him. Like that, started laughing. Like that, but he said that's absolutely true. Those, those, yes, Rick was in the band and he he came up with the band name. So now Randy's telling me after their show at the troop, this is why you got fired. I had no idea, right? And right. it just is news to me. And he said you got kicked out because you were bringing girls home that were, you know, he he was jealous of you doing that. Now that the mm. third question, you said why am I not credited? These are probably the reasons why. Oh, he's, he's not going to acknowledge. Right. That I'm in the band ever. And I had it on my Wikipedia page that I was in the band. And one of the people who were the original people that handed off my picture and number to Black, he was a big fanboy of the band, found ways to get into my Wikipedia page and, and graffiti it. And it was only the paragraphs about Wasp and Steeler. And it was, he would go in there and change everything, saying, Well, Rick, Rick can't play his way out of a paper bag. He has no timing. His timing is so bad, he, he throw him under the bus and blah, blah, blah. I don't know. And, and, and I was getting my Wikipedia page hacked by this guy. Rick, Rick is just pointless. And he keeps getting kicked out of every band he's in. And people at Wikipedia would go back and fix the page for me. And these are some of the things that would come into play about why I couldn't handle being in a band very long. Rick, is, Rick sucks. He's not, not a good bass player, blah, blah, blah. And he's getting kicked out. This kicked out that. He's not in a band any longer than this many weeks. Or, you know, uh, he got kicked out of Steeler because Malmsteen can't stand him. He can't play. Blah, blah. None of this is true. But these are the things that are starting to, the stigmas mm. that are following me around mm. once the internet came in. I can't keep chasing people and arguing with them yeah. over this. But these are the reasons why, why was that why Randy told me. And that was eventually on my first Facebook account. I had 70 photo albums showing my years from New York, New Jersey, L.A., who I played with, 
here's all the credit for me. Here's all the, the I went into great pains to put all of this uh, uh, information underneath the uh, uh, pictures. And when I put the wasp pictures up, and what Randy told me about why I was kicked out of the band, that got back to Randy somehow. He saw it or whatever and asked me, he wrote to me like five times, take that down, take that down. I said, no, this is what you told me. Why do I have to take it down? I guess he didn't like being asked questions about it either. And mm. not long after that, my initial Facebook account was hacked, shut down, and I lost everything. I had like 4,000 plus fans and friends in there. I had all my industry friends, all of my 70 photo albums, Kiss, this band, all gone. Wow. I watched my whole Facebook. Now, I can. I, I don't want to cast aspersions, but right before that happened, there were some haters coming up in Facebook saying, watch Rick Fox's Facebook account. Watch what's going to happen. Mm. Watch what's going to happen. Mm. Interesting. And the, and yeah, there was there were you, warnings. Did you did you write or co-write any of the songs that ended up on the first Wasp album, or did you just play on the demos? Oh, I, I recorded on the demo, and I said that there's the last song was Master of Disaster, okay. which I co oh, right. I, okay. I co wrote with with Blackie. So, okay. so is it fair to say that that song was left off the album because he wouldn't have to credit you, and the songs that remained on the album? you weren't as involved in the songwriting, therefore he could get away with putting them on the first record without. That's yeah, very good, very good, uh, good close estimation. I would, I would have to agree with that. Okay. However, it was brought to my attention years later after the song Wild Child came out. Mm -hmm. Some of the fans started contacting me going, because they already had the demo. They already heard mm -hmm. Master of Disaster. And they would make a side-by-side -side comparison Master of Disaster with Wild Child. They say, you know what? These two songs sound strangely similar in parts of the arrangement. Mm -hmm. wow. So Blackie's not a guy to throw out ideas. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And and wow. there are, I, I listened to them side by each. I said, yes, there's definitely more than just similarity to these songs. So he must have saved, you know, he, he cut up songs and, and rewrite them. And some of the fans were bringing to my attention, there's a good possibility that Wild Child was taken uh, from Master of Disaster. Interesting. Wow. Wow. What do a you, what a what a tangled web. Do you I just want to like sort of level the playing field here. Uh, not once. I, I feel like you've handled all of this, you know, accusation and you know, you 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 work really hard to go do this really cool thing, and then for whatever reason, you're sort of taken out of it. Overall, Rick, it, I feel like you're not not once during this hour we've already been on here talking about your your life. I feel like you're in it to talk shit in it to be angry i don't feel any anger from you at all i don't understand you i i feel like you are okay the way you're telling the story is like someone who is really fucking there not I lived it. I lived yeah, it, yeah well of course but not someone who's you know you you haven't called anybody a name you haven't i mean you know the the way you're describing situations i mean you know somebody might argue with with what i'm saying right now that you called blackie a bully now i don't think that you're calling him you know like yeah he's a fucking you know insert a bad name i feel like you're describing a situation here as to a reason why you're not in the band anymore uh, but I'm, I can I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for yeah, somebody else. Yeah, but if someone were to come in on our socials and your socials and go, that's not true, and God, he's all just what he's all butt hurt about. I'm not getting that vibe at all. How right. are you as a person who's able to say, well, I was in this band and in this band, and what I'm real excited about what I've got going on now, and be calm and cool and pretty much have the same temperament the entire time you've been on the show with us how are you he seems chill? very he seems yeah. very at peace with his whole situation yeah and i feel like that's uh that's something to there's something to be said for that 
Well, you know, life, life, that's, those are good analogies, good observations, no doubt. Uh, life throws stuff at you. And, you know, how are you going to deal with it? Deal with it, you know, like that. And and you can sit there and be bitter and, and consume all of that negative energy. Yeah. And and and, and, and what's that going to get you? You know, you got to... Right. Everything's like a learning stage, and if it's going to get thrown at you, learn something from it, and then go to the next thing, and so on and so forth. So, I've had to develop some kind of way of, you know, accepting the way fate has thrown these things into it, even if it can be funny, make a joke out of it or something, and and move on because it doesn't make sense to hold on to that as an anger thing. Yeah, it just that does nobody any good. Well, I don't see like you're trying to search for any reason to be able to tell some tell us something that's not true either, because it never got you anything other than this was an experience I had, and every word I say is true. It is. It, 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 I have. Listen, it, what what reason would anybody have <laughs> to lie about this? About, it could be easily right. found out. Right. Right. You right. Know? No, the that's what I'm trying to say. You're describing these situations that are, wow, this is going to be cool. Oh, yeah, that wasn't very cool. And here's how it happened and whatever. Well, yeah, you just don't sound so bitter as to someone coming in late to the conversation and just hearing your descriptions. And then we went from A to B to all the way to Z. And then I was gone and not, feel, not you know, not at the end realizing that you're not bitter one bit. It's a lot of negative energy to consume to live with that, you know, and you have to let that go because it's just if it consumes you like that, it's just like a poison, I guess. And and I I it's gotta be logical about it and just move on. I mean Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I'm glad cool. Jason. I'm glad Jason brought that up because I'm getting. I, I got the same vibe too. It's like your explanations are very matter of fact. I don't really sense a lot of bitterness and and uh and I and I'm I'm happy to to see that you deal with it that way because I'm sure that inner peace uh, lets you sleep at night and you're not just walking around furious and bitter and angry. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I don't, I don't hear any name calling was a point that I was making too. Uh, yeah. But some people might, but I'm not, I think it's situational. And uh, these are, these are great rock and roll stories for all fans of stuff that you've been involved with throughout your career. So, yeah, I think we ought to move forward. Let's, okay. let's let's move on to Steeler. So uh, you're famously on that first Steeler record um, with an unknown Ingve Malmsteen, a relatively unknown Ron Keel to the rest of the world. Um, tell us first. Um, tell me your first impressions of Ingve when you met him as a person and as a player. Because he's like 19 years old yeah. when he comes over here, isn't he? Yeah, I'm thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, Does he speak well, English? Yeah, you see how he spoke some English. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we went to the airport to pick him up. Me, Ron, and Mark. You know, in the in the road road crew, and he comes walking down the ramp out of out of the plane. Now, that's a different person from the person we spoke to on the phone when Mike Varney did the three way phone conference and introduced us to Ingve over the phone. Over the phone. He was like this, yeah, man, I can't wait to get there and be in your band and a real hard charger, uh, all upbeat and forward. Yeah, 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 let's, let's do this. Let's do this. And then the guy gets off the plane, and he's coming down the, the ramp, and it's like the hair flip thing like this, you know, and 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 all the necklaces with the pentagrams and, and dark stuff. On. It's like the Viking has arrived. That was the impression I got, <laughs> you know, like it was too, too cool for cool. Uh, like that, and uh, uh, how do I how do I put this? Uh, yeah, we we're interested. We heard his obviously. We heard his his tapes. Mike Varney played his tapes. Ron was already talking to Varney about because once once I was solidified in the band. Okay, now we need a lead guitarist because uh, you know Ron had scrapped the whole lineup, and and I had he saw my ad in uh, Music Connection magazine or something, and and and. So I met with Ron and they gave me the songs to, to learn and like that. So now Ron and Mark and I had already had all the songs down. So now it's time to bring in the guitar. So Ron got in touch with Mike Varney and, and got us, you know, Ingve Malmsteen. Uh, and, you know, we had a 
rent extra gear. Uh, all of the gear that Steeler had all was belonged to the rest of the band. The truck, the lights, the tresses, all of the gear, when Ron let that band lineup go, that all went away. So there was no gear, there was no lights, there was no PA. It was all we had to rent stuff now, like that. And so uh anybody got his guitar and, and we got to rent an extra amp. I think we were renting stuff from SIR. And I had I had my own amp, I had my own gear. Uh Mark had his drums like that out of storage. And and you know, we just started to to work on the songs like that. And and at one point, uh, I'll never forget this. Um, um, we stopped in the rehearsal that we had, a, we were, we were the only four white guys living in an all black neighborhood in LA. And, and so the, the neighborhood could hear us rehearsing through the walls. So there were a couple of forays of us trying to chase people out of the property area. We're trying to, you know, look to see if they can steal anything. Uh, we were the only white guys in the neighborhood there. And it was, you know, it was a, it was a neighborhood of concern, I'll say that. So anyway, um, so we get the gear. We, we got some gear for Ingve. We got he had his guitar and whatnot. And we're rehearsing, rehearsing. And he stops at one point and he says, Hey man, can we do something about these songs to make it a little more interesting? Because they're really quite fucking boring. It was that that quiet in the room. Oh, that, yeah. that, that that hot that three four thousand pound elephant in the room. <laughs> and I looked up at Mark on the drum riser. He looked up at the ceiling. I looked at Ron. And if, if you know in acting what a slow burn is, somebody stands it. Like uh, uh, you know, the actors in, in the old 20s and 30s, you know, like Ben Turpin, they do this, you know, you, you can see the, the fire coming out of their ears. Ron did that. Ron Cayley that. He just was stunned that Ingve actually said this to him. And and it was just that that elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Ron goes, okay, man. Okay. Okay. Fine. Like that. The next day, he was already calling guitar players in while yeah. Ingve was living with us. And we were auditioning other guitar players for like a week. Like that, you know. And, and Ingve had to sit there in the other room and listen to us, you know, audition guitar players. That was really awkward. Wow. So Ingve was there while you're auditioning guitar players? He had no place else to go. We we all lived in three gutted storefronts. The mm. insides were gutted, so you could walk through all of them. And there was a kitchen area, kitchen storage, which was the waterbed where Ingve was sleeping. And I can't tell you how, how many roaches there were around the stove. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> then there was the main room. Ron slept in one little cubby hall area on one side with a curtain around it. Mark slept on a couple of on a mattress on some milk crates over by the bathroom. Then it was the rehearsal room. And off to the side of the rehearsal room was my room. I was like, you know, a, a storefront, a storefront, a storefront like that. So mm. there was nothing between us and the street, but glass windows that were blacked out. Wow. Yeah. You know, so I'm, like I'm assuming, I'm assuming this is happening before the album, right? Oh yeah. So, so how, how do you maintain the peace in order to keep Ingve in the band to get the album done? If, if you're auditioning guitar players three feet away from him. Well, the day after, after about a four or five guitar players worth of auditions, Ingve finally comes up to Ronnie and goes, look, all right, all right, let's, let's just, just do this. All right. Let's learn. I'll learn the songs. Let's just do this. Let's, let's get it done. So, so uh, that's when it all came together and, and we became so tight. You couldn't slip a piece of paper in between us. We rehearsed for hours, take a break, rehearse for hours, take a break next day, rehearse for hours. Take a break. There was a, a huge industrial clear plastic bag tacked to the wall outside the rehearsal room. And it was filled with those yellow earphone plugs. Mm -hmm. Look like a bag of popcorn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you, you go in the rehearsal room, you stick your hand in a bag, grab a pair of earplugs like that. And that's, then we go in there and, and you know, you could hear from the street. You could hear through the walls of yeah. us, of us, uh, of rehearsing. we were that loud. And we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. And was it long after that? The first gig offer came in, which was, uh, I think, March 11th of, of, of uh, 883. 
and we got a, uh, we were opening for Hughes Thrall. Far out. Yeah. Which was, you know, Glenn Hughes and Pat Thrall. Yeah. And, and so that was, that was my baptism by fire. And everybody who was anybody was at that show. Wow. You know, and, and so, yeah, so it, it, it's how it came together. And, and these, these guys were all, you know, uh, nobody had stage clothes. You know, yeah. I mean, Mark, our drummer, Mark Edwards, he was wearing just like gym shorts and sneakers. He didn't even wear a shirt. Like, he, Mark was like Tommy Aldridge. Yeah. He looked yeah. like Tommy, looked a little like Tommy. <laughs> Tommy was one of his, his aspiring look to, uh, uh, you know, inspirations. So he kind of had that Tommy Aldridge look. And, and, and he was from Texas. So uh, Ron didn't really have that. Ron had some stage clothes. Yngwie had no stage clothes. Here comes Rick Fox with a bag full of stage clothes. <laughs> okay, let me open the bag. Yngwie, you can wear this. You, Mark, you can wear that. Ron, you can wear this. Like that. And so I was dressing the guys then because I had stage clothes. from They brought with me from Jersey eventually. Mm -hmm. All my, my, my E. Walker band, all my stage clothes came out. So I had stuff to loan everybody for pictures and shows and and whatnot. And, How long uh, did this version of Steeler stay together? Uh, our first show is March, March 11th of, of 83 till the end of May. And we did That's the Roxy. Short. We did Perkins Palace. Oh, supporting Quiet Riot. Right when Mental Health went to number one. That was a, that was a hell of a show. I bet. Uh, yeah, we, we, we played a lot of shows packed into those several months like you that. guys i think you guys played the stone in san francisco uh not the stone it was uh it was um what the hell was it called uh, uh Mabu mabuhe gardens no it was it mabuhe on broadway no it was uh oh shit it's, it's at a tip of my tongue hmm. um it was we weren't even scheduled to play there we were up in katati at the rising something rising sun so record we were recording the album and Ingve's fans the, the the grapevine was burning up mm -hmm. that he was in san francisco somewhere thereabouts we were about 50 miles or so north of san francisco recording the album uh at prairie sun and they were demanding that this club get momstein in there to play because he had all his his fan base yeah, tape traders and such. Exactly. Knew about Bingo. Them. Yeah. That was it. That was it. Mm -hmm. And so we had to, they asked us to come down and in the middle of the recording to drive back down to San Francisco and do the show with them. And and the audience was like, you could go right down the center of the audience. Everybody on from the middle over to Ingve side was all Malmsteen fans, with most tape trader friends. And from the middle over to the other side was the Steeler fans. Yeah. And I've, I've heard one of the, you know, the bootleg tapes that somebody had by the soundboard of that show. And some of the people saying some of the most derogatory things into that tape recorder about us and about how Malmsteen was God. Well, you're, so, you're keeping it real because these are stories that I am aware of um, just because of like uh fanzines the the tape trading people have put out and written articles about said show <clears throat> um oh, was it the old waldorf old waldorf old, oh, right old waldorf. okay far out that, yeah that's that a, show. that's infamous and the show is very quite infamous um yeah and we were in, you, we were in, we were in y and t country yes yes now were you up that that far were you in northern california uh because of mike because of varney because he wanted to be there during the recordings and he set it all up it was in in katati was okay. the name of the town okay and it was it was a it was a it was several buildings we were in one building there was something else in another building and up at the top was uh, the, the the control board and all that other stuff like that they were running wires between the buildings and stuff wow. like that. But so, Varney, yeah. but Varney is from that part of the part of California. Yeah, that yeah. Northern California. Okay. Yeah, like that. Yeah. And, and so and and uh and I tell you, wow. boy, it was it was like New York cold up there at night. Wow, we were yeah. Freezing. It was like sub zero temperatures. And yeah. and man, we had to pack everything that wasn't nailed down where we were living and put it into truck. And Jimmy and Alan, the brothers, our, our, our sound guy and and uh, uh, guitar tech respectively and pete the drummer drummer drum roadie 
all of us together. We took everything that wasn't nailed down because who knows if it would be there when we got back. Right. And that name, I mean, right, right around the corner from us was the home of Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. Right. So it was not, you know, we were the only white guys in the neighborhood. Wow. I love okay, so, Roscoe. I love Roscoe's chicken and waffles, man. That shit's good. There, there's a plug right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, and we everything went with us in the truck up to up to Katati to, wow. to record, and then we had to bring some of it with us back down to San Francisco to do the show, bring it back up to Katati to the studio, and then eventually drive it all back down back home. Right, like that. So what what was the what was the moment or the straw that eventually broke the the back of Steeler? There had to be a a pivotal moment where it just all fell apart. After our last show that we did together, there's an Orange County somewhere, and Ron said it's going to be a band meeting tomorrow. I said all right, and and at that particular show. And it was a great show. We we killed at that show. Hot, sweaty, half naked. People were going nuts. Uh, um, it was a good show. And uh, I had mentioned to Ron, Ron was wearing his wristbands with these studs in them, pointed studs. And at one point in the show, Ingley and I would go up to the front together, and we'd be shoulder to shoulder playing together. Ron would come up between us, the both of us, and put his arms around both of us right in the middle. And then he'd back off so we could split. And his wristband with the studs got caught in my hair. And he wound mm. up yanking my hair and, and some of my hair in the... Like, so I mentioned to him after the show, I said, can you kind of be careful next time you do that? He ripped out a... He looked at me in a way that Ron had never spoken to me before. He looked at me and he goes, okay, man. I got the message. <laughs> he never talked to me like that before. Mm. Uh, that, that was weird. The next day, we're supposed to have the band meeting, and and this is in this is in Orange County, it's right next to the Woodstock. It's the next club next to the Woodstock, hmm. and um, I wake up, you know, there's no no band meeting. Ron's not there, Ingvay's not. It's just me and Mark, drummer Mark Edwards. Mark says, "Well, it falls upon me to be the bearer of bad news." I said, "What's up?" He says. Uh, um, the band's band's breaking up. I said, "What do you mean?" He says, "Well, Ron's not here. He was over at somebody else's house. Mom's scene was off. Uh, me, he was already had met with. He was, somewhere during this time. He, Mom's scene had found time to meet with people from or rep managers of other bands. Okay. Uh, I, I." Somebody told me I introduced Momsi during one of our show breaks, one of the clubs. I introduced him apparently to Phil Moog from UFO. Mm, cool. So people were coming to see us from bigger bands. And uh, apparently anybody got scouted for Alcatraz. Andy Truman was there, their, their manager at the time. And uh, so I was told he's Mingbei's already leaving the band. So this was just hitting me like brand new. I had no idea. And that left came to me and he says, well, you're out of the band too. I said, Why? What did I do? Because it's just a decision Ron and I made. Uh, it's nothing personal. We're scrapping the lineup and starting over. I said, so Ron's in it. You're in it. Mom's scene's already joining Alcatraz. And I'm out. What did I do? Yeah. There was no tangible answer to that question. Right. That was just just the decision that Ron and Mark had made. So I came out of this thing not really knowing why I was out of out of the picture now. Right. Uh, and the album was already done. That was in the can. Just a matter of, of being released in a month or two after that. Yeah. And so that's how I found myself uh, out of Steeler. So by the time wow. that album is out, the band is already broken up. And new members. Yeah. Oh, they wow. did, a, did an album signing at Tower Records on Sunset, and I was not invited. Wow. Because mm -hmm. I remember it's hearing that record again, having grown up in San Antonio. We had a, a radio station. Uh, we had a DJ named Joe Anthony, the Godfather, Joe the Godfather Anthony. And he used to champion a lot of this underground metal stuff and new wave of British heavy metal stuff. And that's the first time I heard Steeler, and it was uh, Hot on Your Heels. 
And of course the guitar solo that leads into it just set right. everybody on fire. It was like, we haven't heard anything like this since eruption. Everybody was, you know, minds blown. Who is this? What is this? And then, and then Ron's voice was great too. And I just remember thinking, wow, this is really something. And so, but I have now, today's the first I'm learning that I, as I'm hearing that in San Antonio on the radio, that band is already gone and disbanded. Yep. yep. Wow. Uh, yeah. Mom's scene, Mom's scene used to do that, that whole solo live too, with the overdrive and, and the yeah, band, rah, yeah. I've seen it in the middle shop, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We were, yeah. We were doing that live. Wow. Uh, it gave us a chance to breathe. Okay. Like Cause Mark didn't do his own solo. So Ingve had that whole time for him to showcase and shine, you know, his abilities. Wow. And, and so, yeah. And, and we're the, the I'm at a sealer. What did I do? Well, you didn't do anything. I don't, I was going to say you didn't do anything. It sounded to me like, uh, you guys were, uh, don't, uh, well, good or bad, neither here nor there, no harm, no foul. Ingve used you guys as a stepping stone. I'm not even saying anything bad about Ingve. I just think that there was an agenda that was not, a parent to you guys. Well, we definitely gave him the stepping off point, introducing him That's to right. America. That's, That's right. right. That well, I think that it's yeah. it's important to give credit to to Steeler, to even to Mike Varney, to uh, the tape traders, to everyone involved to, uh, you know, have a reason to covet that Steeler record because yes. it's a goddamn kick ass fucking record. Classic. And I'm, I'm extremely excited that that whatever hell people had to go through, uh, socially, mentally, physically, uh, they had to wear your stage outfit, you know, whatever the fuck it was <laughs> to, yeah. to get that record made. It needed to be made. And, uh, you know, uh, I just appreciate the stories. Yeah. yeah thank I want to thank I wanna echo that for a band that was around for such a short period of time, you put out, you managed to somehow scrape together and put out an album that uh, is still to this day, so highly revered among a certain crowd within a certain audience. And, you know, you hold up that album cover and you show that to somebody and they go, Oh yeah, dude. I mean, it's instantaneous, the reaction to that record. And I had no idea the band was only together for a handful of months. And, and by the time the album came out, the band was done. I knew it was a short lived band. I didn't know it was that short lived. Well, it's well, it, 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 Steeler was it already in LA a year before that with the original lineup. Mm. But, you know, and I had seen them. I saw them at the Roxy. Uh, I was there with Eric Carr before he passed away. Wow. And we were watching Steeler. And the thing that stood out was Ron's voice. This guy yeah. was hitting notes of like, we're, we're waiting for the win windows in the building to shatter. Yeah. Yeah. But his guys were, they are good musicians. Ron, I think, wanted more of a show to, yeah. to, to, to complement the musical abilities. They were all very good players in their own right. But, you know, Tim, the bass player, would just anchor himself back by the bass amp and not do anything. Mike yeah. Dunnigan, guitar player, he did this kind of interesting little walk back and forth across the stage, but they're really doing and, and Mark Edwards wasn't even in the band at that point in the original lineup. Ron wanted to take it to the next level. And he said, your name came. I had, <coughs> excuse me. I had an ad running in the music connection magazine that I was looking for a gig. And the only names that I was affiliated with was kiss and Thor. Cause I'd worked with Thor back mm -hmm. in Jersey. Yeah. And, and, but nobody knew anything. There's no internet back then. So Ron said, he saw my ad. He was impressed. He called me up. I went over to their rehearsal place where they were all living, and there was there was no gear. It was all gone. So yeah. I mean, he had sacked the whole lineup. He he was he was taking a leap of faith, no doubt. And he says your name you can is <clears throat> being passed around a lot. Your guy with an image, I see definitely. He goes, I want to go to that next level. I want us to look like we're an already signed touring act. Yeah, and and, then, and you got highly recommended for that. Now let's see what you can do with the bass. Yeah. And I, I, I brought it to the table and I, I obviously got the gig. And so um, he changed after Malmsteen left. They wanted to do something again, different. I don't know what all of the conversation was, but while we were together as that lineup, we were like almost untouchable. You know, I think um, 
Uh, we did shows with Black and Blue. We did uh, 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 Sound Barrier, uh, Le uh, Leather Angel. You know, but there was we were like a cornerstone of one of the bands on the LA because Steeler already had a name before we, I got to them. Yeah, like that. So uh, it was it was a really interesting ride being in that band, and we were all living together. You know, within the three the gutted storefronts that we were living in. So, you know, there really wasn't that much privacy. There was a common area. The girl I was dating at the time brought in furniture. They didn't have any of this stuff. She brought in tables, chairs, microwave oven, you know, trying to make the comforts a little easier. Because yeah. this was this was be, be below Spartan living. You know, it was it was, <laughs> it was you know, I learned all the different ways of making top ramen from one of the from the guitar tech. <laughs> you know, and, and our, our sound guy, Mark Mark Workman. Uh, brought over this little miniature pop-up TV VCR player, and because we had no TV, and he would record hours and hours of MTV, you know, and 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 we'd sit there during our breaks, all of us, like eight or so of us, all curved around watching this little three four inch TV screen, oh my watching God. all the videos from MTV, <laughs> you know, seeing what's out there like that. That's rough. That, yeah. It was. That's it was. rough. Was. Well, I, I think you I, I think you have an album that you can be proud of for the rest of your life. I know a lot of uh, people in the heavy metal underground and the heavy metal world look at that Steeler record and 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 hold it in high regard. And uh, I think if you get to do that once in your life, you've accomplished more than a lot of us ever have or, or something that a lot of us wish we could have. So. Uh, I congratulate you on that Steeler record. So, sure. so in the in the nineties and like the first few years of two thousands, is there this like, what are you doing after in between things like that? Well, after Steeler, I was already I was now on the map. Oh yeah, and and so I I put together uh, two different lineups of my own band, Sin. Okay, and we got we got huge. We were big in the clubs. Cool. We were huge. I had I had three guys from the New York band Alien, and Frank Starr. All right. Yeah. And 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 Jay Christie, who was my guitar player in Jersey, he was now in, in Alien, so he came uh, and and with the, his other guitar player Richie, and we got another drummer who I I I'd known from uh, something previous, and we put together. I, I I now had free reign to call the shots and do it my way. So I real, I did real our, quick, our, our, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, Rick. Uh, Alien has a record or two out, correct? They had an EP. An EP, okay. Because I've seen yeah. that around, I think. We did almost all the songs off the EP. Because it happened so fast, Jason, that we didn't have time to really like, start writing all these new songs. So so we we padded our, our set a little. So we did some Alien songs. We had some Sin songs. And we kind of just buying time until we could write new stuff. And it was a kick in the head for all the fans because they never got the West Coast, never got to see the Alien songs. Right. You know, like that performed live. Yeah. Because yeah. Alien, Alien was a New York band. So so Jay arranged, Jay, Jay Christie contacted me. And he says, listen, you know, the guys in Kiss. He goes, I know they're auditioning guitar players. You can give me an audition. I said, well, I think they already have somebody. But my lineup of Sin, my first lineup, has just, uh, I split. I left the band. It was a lot of lot of friction, uh, and and I I I need, to, I need to put another version together. So he said, "I'll bring the singer and the other guitar player with me." And now I got us a drummer, and we got together really fast. And so we padded the account with Alien songs and some Sin songs until we could get new material. And man, it just took off! Holy cow! You know, we were we were headline though the. The, the booking agent at the Troubadour, I, I calls her up and I says, I have a new band I'd like to, to bring in, you know, play at the Troubadour. And she says, well, you know, like everybody starts at like a Wednesday night at eight o'clock or something like that. I said, I just played your club not long ago. I sold it out. She goes, who is this? I said, it's Rick Fox. She goes, what band were you with? I said, Steeler. She goes, what night would you like to play on? And who do you want to have open and close for you? That's exactly how it happened. I was like, well, that's that's different. Thank you. <laughs> and and so they were helping us pick bands to open the clothes and like that. And and I that's how it happened. And we went in there and I've still got about 
eight or nine, ten cassettes of all our live shows uh, successively. Wow. And we're playing all these, we're getting bigger gigs, bigger venues, Orange Pavilion. We did a show with Keel. Uh, I got to show my stuff now in front of Ron, like that. And and Sin got really big. We were on the threshold of getting signed, and the whole thing fell apart. And it's a story a lot of bands can relate to. You're right sure. there, right there, and everything goes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we were in a state of Strum was producing us. So, and he did all kinds of things to, to help. He thought he was helping, and it, just, it kind of dissolved. So we had we had there was, there was some just some re, re, residual friction with with Dana Strum, uh, and I'm not the only person I hear in the business that has issues with him. That's another story. Uh, anyway, so Sin got really big. We headlined the downtown LA street scene in '84. So we must have played our biggest crowd. It'd be five thousand people, the full city block, building to building, one end to the other, just an yeah. ocean of people. That's a famous uh, happening, isn't it? It was. Yeah, the uh, well, it. yeah, yeah, the LA street scene thing. Uh yeah. there's footage of uh, Guns N' Roses playing that in the mid 80s, probably right around the same time. Well, probably the year after us. Okay. Uh cuz we were there in 84. Okay. And yeah. Striper went on after us. This was not this was like our second show with Striper. But we weren't we headlined. But Striper went on after us. Yeah, and, and Striper I mean, Striper was called for a while. They were called something else. Uh, yeah. Um, 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 Rock's regime. It's yeah, Rock's regime. Rock's, Rock's regime. Rock's exactly. regime. Yeah, thank you, David. Rock's That's, regime. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and they they came up and uh, uh, right before we went on, the people were pounding in the street, going sin, sin, sin. sin. The whole front of the stage had fifty five gallon drums full of water, just as a barrier, because people mm -hmm. were shaking them, and the water was splashed up. And and the guys from Striper, like we went back and we're peeking through my amp line. And Robert, Robert Sweet's like, oh my God. It's like an ocean of people like that. <laughs> cool. they, these guys, they were nervous, you know. Yeah. Uh um, I have some pictures that standing on the back of our amp line that I took um I took one of the seat risers and I pulled it over. I had the roadies pull it in front of the drum riser. Now we had steps to go up to the drum riser like that. There were so many different interesting things that happened at that show. Uh, but that was one of our big breakthrough shows for us. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and, and it was just to see Frank Starr in rare form uh, as, a, as a front man was great. And, and so that was, that was sin. We were, we were doing the, uh, a four song master album demo in, in Burbank at uh, Candon. And we were bringing in, we were replacing Frank and the drummer with um, a new singer who sounded a lot like Ronnie Dio. It's like a cross between Dio and, and Rob Halford. But the, the guy wanted to like take over the band and make us his backup band. I wasn't mm. going to stand for that. Mm. Um, but up until that point, yeah, Sin was like, like I said, we were on the threshold. I think Dana was going to get us signed through the same label Vinnie Vincent was on. It was a lecture or something like that. Or a chrysalis. That's what it was. And then, uh, and that fell through. So I had a I had to lick my wounds. I played with Burn for several months. I wound up in Arizona playing with Surgical Steel. Far out. We we're, get, were getting ready to go in the studio and record an album with them in in uh, in uh, Katati somewhere. Not Katati. Um, somewhere in Phoenix. We were recording. And Dan Wexler from Icon yeah. was producing. Yeah, he was our he was our producer. Cool. And then, then that broke up. Man, you got to be a serious fucking nerd to know who Dan Wexler is. I know who Dan Wexler is. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to be a metal fucking nerd to just say, yeah, you know, Dan Wexler, fucking icon. I know him. Yeah, yeah icon, icon, exactly. Well, that's another and, and, that's another Mike Varney thing. Yeah, and, and yeah. while we were in the process of recording, who shows up one night but uh, George Lynch and Mick Brown? Far out. <laughs> and, we, just, and, and, we just had George on the show. George sits down in the lounge. And dumps out this, this white powder. Uh -oh. like, and here comes the chop, 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 chop. I'm, I'm, my stomach's churning, just looking at it, going, no, no. And and, uh, and we were having a, trying to get this one song that I brought in recorded. And, and they ran a couple of passes to Mick. He says, all right, let's do this. Mick got down and we recorded, Mick and I, the rhythm section to the song called We Got Your Rock. Bam, just like that. 
He says, I don't know what people say about you about not being able to play. He goes, you're just as good as Pilsen. Like that, which is a high compliment for me. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mick, Mick nailed it. Like after one or two takes passes of it, he had it down and, and we, we nailed it. Wexler's like, that's it. It's done. It's in the can. Like that. And, uh, and there are still people trying to find the remnants of that recording session and put it out. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, this is, is this sin? We're still talking. This is sin, right? No, now I mean surgical steel. Surgical right. steel. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We went from, from sin to burn to surgical steel. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, like that, you know, and and because Jimmy, Jimmy contacted me, Jimmy Keeler, and they flew me out to Arizona because I, I didn't know who surgical steel was. I called, so I said, who's surgical wow. steel? They said, you like Judas Priest? I said, yeah. They said, it sounds just like Judas Priest. Yeah. yeah. Halford lives in Phoenix. He gets yeah. up and jams with them every once in a while. And, Oh, okay. Well, interesting, and, and and not to pull you away from your story, we've we've kind of we've had you on for a long, long time today. We appreciate your time, and I'm and I'm not by any means trying to trying to slam on the brakes here, but but listen, I just want to point out how fucking interesting it is that your newest project that you have, you are in Freak Show. And Greg Chason, who has uh, has gotten you into this wonderful situation, was also in Surgical Steel. Yeah. And now, not only that, he was also in Steeler. That's right. After me. <laughs> so so we kind of, we're chasing each other here, you know? So you and Greg are, are sweet. Yeah. We yeah were y'all like are just of, sweet. That's all there is. Yeah. There's a step in. It's right there. You know, here's Greg, then it's me. Then it's Greg, then it's me. Well, I brought that up to him. He thought it was really funny. I think that it's you and Greg right here, bro. Just uh, He's a much better bass player than I am. Well, hey, keep it strong, <laughs> though. You know, keep it strong. For some reason, you know, you guys are, you're right there hanging, hanging out. So, yeah, you know, look, you. looking out for each other is, uh, is what it's all about anyway. So, yeah. well, you know, back when I was, you know, in, in, in Steeler time, I knew of Greg. Uh, he and I really weren't that close as friends. I have a picture of us early on at, at one of the NAMM shows. She just took a picture. And he just looks like this bruiser like thing, you know. And then it was over sometime over the years, we just started to talk. And it turns out that he and I had a lot of the same bass, er, bass player influences. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, Mel Schatcher from Grand Funk, uh, um, uh, Tim Boga and Cactus. Uh, you know, the guys in Steppel, we had a lot of the same influences. And so we had grown closer that way. And we started talking and it's like, why were we even looking at each other like askance at each other? There's a $3 word, askance. Yeah. Why were we even having that vibe when we had so much in common? Yeah. You know, and we, yeah. we grew to be really good friends. Um, that last NAM show we were at before my wife passed away, I was like, um, the hell was it? Um, I, I can't remember. I, we we took some pictures together. His wife and and my wife got together and friends and like all of that. It was really cool that we looked back and why did we waste so much time looking at each other funny like that when we could have been friends sooner, like that. And you know, so he came in this Steeler after me, and then I got into Surgical Steel, and I got out of Surgical Steel, and he came in after me, like that. It was like this weird kind of pattern following each other like that. It was really weird. Um, what was the joke I had? Um, I was in Steeler with Ron Keel, and then I was in Surgical Steel with Jim Keeler. Right. So there's that word play again with that. Is this right? These weird things. I, I, I you sit down and think about it for a second. Ago. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of weird. We've had Greg on the show, and we were talking about. Uh, his band Atomic Kings and we were uh great band great talking band. about we were yeah. talking about yes um we were talking about Metal Massacre which I held up on camera of course and uh he he had reminded me that he was in Phoenix uh and that he had played with uh Surgical Steel and Bagali he's he recorded that version of uh Rivet Head yeah. yeah. So not only do we have Atomic Kings, I also have his band before that, Kings of Dust. Nice. Yeah. Both. Yeah. So and it, it's I just love listening to his playing. I love his bass playing. Yeah, he's a he's a really amazing guy too. And, and we share a lot of the same roots as far as our influences. Yeah. Rick, one last question, very random, and uh, and 
and then and then we'll touch on freak show real quick and 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 we got to wrap it up but i wanted to ask people that listen to the show watch the show they're all fans of decline of western civilization the metal years and you are in that movie so uh tell us real quick what band are you in in that movie uh and 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 tell us for people that are, go and watch that movie when can they find you in the movie and then we got to wrap up. I'm in, I'm in several different segments. I'm in the cat house segment. Um, uh, there's a there was a, a segment they call the light bulb kids, where everybody would sit there and be interviewed with this one single light bulb. Over yeah, 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 yeah. And I I brought my my uh, my BC Rich Warlock bass as a as a kind of a prop instead of just sitting in a chair saying so. Um, we got invited by Penelope Spears' daughter, Anna, to be in the film. We were all hanging out in the cat house, Ricky Rackman's cat house. Yeah. And, and so they were looking for all these various people to be in this film. And I didn't have a full band together yet. I had a, a singer who's passed away some years back, uh, Tommy John. He was from out of, out of Cleveland in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and he was my singer at the time. We were putting a, another band together. We didn't really have a, a full name yet, so we just called the band Sex. You know, and, and we went, you know, like you cross your fingers. These are the two X's in sex. I, we did because I didn't know, we didn't know we'd have a full band yet. But Tommy and I did the on camera interview like that. And and uh, Penelope Spheres is asking us the questions about she was looking from a different angle for something to be kind of sillier and goofier uh, yeah. because it was kind of a spoof. On, on, yeah, on I agree with that. I agree. Yeah. I don't think it was yeah. as serious as I expected it to be. Yeah. And we were being serious. And I, I, she says, so what is it about you trying to be famous or, you know, being in a band and, right. and what does it mean to you? And I said, look, the minute you doubt is, is the second you die. Right. And a lot of people remember that line in the movie. And that's yeah. kind of been kind of a, a, side, a side mantra for me is, is, you know, not to give up, just to keep at it. Well, no matter it what. Is, it is definitely a piece of pop culture history and definitely a piece of heavy metal pop culture history uh, love it or hate it everybody knows that movie and uh everybody watches it over and over and over whether they're laughing at it or just enjoying it or whatever or reminiscing about the times or whatever uh so i i wanted to bring that up because i think it's really cool that you were in it um i was in i was in the cat the cat house what are the cat house segments yeah. ricky rackman's cat house yeah uh, you know the, the there was uh the one girl the brunette on my right was was bambi uh, she, I introduced her to Chris, uh, Eric Carr and she mm -hmm. became an item with Eric Carr and she's on the cover of the poison album, open up and say, ah, Oh, cool. And ah. That's the model for that. Album, you know, with the, the big tone. And then the, the blonde on my left was a Christina who I was going out with off and on, uh, like that. And we just happened to catch that segment with the, maybe between the two girls like that. So that was that, <laughs> that thing there. Um, I think that's the only two major high points I could think of. It was an interesting film. Um, yeah. Of course, everybody remembers the Chris Holmes segment in the pool. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we were friends with, with Penelope Spheres. She used to come hang out with all of the rockers on Sunday at this one park. We'd all hang out and have picnics and stuff. So she got to know all of us and she invited us all into the movie. And that's how I got into Wayne's World. Because when oh, she, was, yeah. she, she was filming the first Wayne's World and they were taking a break between shots. And I hear the the, the, make, the, the, the maker from go, I wreck flax. Where are you? I need you over here. Rick Fox. Everybody's looking at me going, what did you do? And I said, I don't know. She's go over and see what she wants. And then uh, I said, okay, what, what do you need? And she put me in this scene with Dana Carvey. She so goes, what, you were just on, you were on set? Were you, were you? Yeah, the, everybody from Hollywood was in that film. All the, we were yeah. all in the crowd. And you know, the, 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 when, when uh, uh, the, the band is playing. Okay. okay. The drummer, the drummer, Anthony Fox, he's a producer now. Yeah. yeah, but he was he was the drummer in, in one of the bands there, uh, Tommy Gunn or Tommy Tommy. Yeah, I think it was Tommy Gunn. He was a drummer in that. Um, Mark Ferrari was one of the guitar players. Yeah, yeah. In the in the, in the band like that, uh, I like that. So we were filming this this club scene where, where well Mike Myers and Dana Carvey and his entourage come walking through the crowd. So Penelope Spheres says, "I this is what I need you to do." And I'm like, "Wow, you need me for yes." So she put me in that scene. She says, "They're all gonna." Push past you, block Dana Carvey. He's the last one. And so we block him. That's where that scene comes in where he goes, I'd like to get through now. And, and the guy goes, <laughs> what do you want, you little dweeb? And I kind of, I'm looking at the band and I work my way off the screen. 
<laughs> like that. And then that's what he did. They, they play the, 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 um, um, uh, the, uh, what the hell is that show? Dun, 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 dun. You know, uh, uh, and he goes out and gets the stun gun. And he comes back and he goes, he says the same line again to the bully and he hits him with the stun gun and the guy go, flies through the air and then he, where he lands is right at my feet. And you can see him wearing a white leather pants and the, the jacket with all the colors on it. So that's that was, you know, Penelope, of all the people she could have picked, she yeah. picked me to be in that scene <laughs> with, with Dana Cargill. So that was pretty cool. Far out. That's awesome. Yeah, that is really cool. Yeah. Well, man, you've obviously got a very uh, rich history of, of of rock and roll, and and we do enjoy you spending some time with us and sharing so many great stories with us today. Uh, man, the the Steeler and the Wasp stuff, huge chapters uh, in in rock and roll, and and obviously in your life, and uh, and we wish you luck on the latest chapter, Freak Show. Uh, the album is called So Shall It Be. It's currently out. Uh, Rick plays bass in the current lineup along with Carlos Cavasso on guitar, Stet Howland on drums, and Ronnie Borshert on vocals and also guitar. And uh, hopefully we'll see you out on the road. Meantime, go check out the album, So Shall It Be, from Freak Show. Rick, we thank you so much for being here today. On behalf of my co-host, Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave Glessner with our special guest today, Rick Fox, on the Talk Louder podcast. (laughs) 